Benjamin Franklin, born in 1706, grew up in Boston with nine brothers and sisters. Though his schooling ended when he was 10, he read and educated himself for the rest of his life. At age 17, he ran away to Philadelphia, where he worked for a few months in printing houses, and then moved to London, where he worked as a typesetter. By 1726, he was back in Philadelphia and began a career as a printer and publisher of books and newspapers. This essay on what Franklin called the increase of mankind was written in the 1750s, several years before he got involved in the movement for American independence and eventually became the first U.S. ambassador to France. His studies on the abundance of food and farmland in the American colonies and resulting rapid American population growth were read later by Thomas Malthus in England. Franklin's ideas played a key role in Malthus's own formulation of what he would call the power of population. This short pamphlet was not written mainly as a scientific analysis of population, though, but rather as a piece of propaganda directed at British leaders, advancing the interests of the American colonies. Franklin's arguments about population are used to support his personal economic and political agenda in this case. Benjamin Franklin begins this short pamphlet without any hint of the big national policies that provided his real motive for writing it. He begins with a reference to, quote, tables formed on observations upon the bills of mortality, christenings, and so on, unquote. This is a reference to the work of Englishman John Grant almost a hundred years earlier, who had collected such lists of deaths from hospitals and christenings from churches. Grant is usually recognized as the first person to systematically calculate birth and death rates in a population, and Franklin apparently was familiar with his work. Franklin is mainly concerned with the question of births, or in his terms, marriages, which he assumes will always lead to births. He makes two claims about the colonial American situation. First, he claims that the country is mostly empty, populated by hunters who have very low population density. It is not very honest of him to say that the Native Americans were, quote, easily prevailed on to part with portions of that territory, unquote, since the European invaders were usually taking lands by force and driving the natives away. But his basic point is that there was a lot of land that European settlers could get very cheaply and set up farming at young ages, rather than waiting to inherit existing farms from parents who went on living to ripe old ages. Secondly, Franklin claims that the opportunity to start independent farming at such young ages meant that Americans married very young and all started having lots of babies. This meant, he said, that while families in Europe averaged only four children, American families averaged eight children. This might sound like a lot of children to our modern ears, but historians still estimate similar figures today for the colonial period. On the other hand, Franklin also makes the offhand assumption that, quote, one half grow up, unquote. This implies that he's allowing for incredibly high infant mortality, with half of all births dying before reaching adult ages. Again, infant and child mortality may not have been quite this high, but historical estimates also support something like this extremely high rate of uncontrolled mortality for infants and children. So, if American couples averaged four surviving adult children each, the population would double with each generation. A generation is nothing but the age difference between parents and children, which Franklin guessed was about 20 years. These observations from the American colonies, including this estimate of doubling time, show up again transplanted into the writings of Thomas Malthus a little over 40 years later. Modern demographers have gone over Franklin's facts and figures and generally find that his calculations were surprisingly accurate and give a good picture of the population dynamics of his day. In addition to this natural increase, of course, we have to make allowance for additional population growth due to continued immigration of people into the country. Franklin doesn't say much about immigration as a source of population growth, except to say that, quote, Labor is no cheaper now in Pennsylvania than it was 30 years ago, 
though so many thousand laboring people have been imported, unquote. And this remark gets us to the heart of the reason Franklin had to write this little pamphlet in the first place. All his careful, reasonably accurate, and insightful comments about population dynamics are only here to lay the foundation for a much more concrete issue. The issue of whether the American colonies should be allowed to have their own factories and manufacture their own finished goods. Franklin is crusading for this goal, and he faces stiff opposition from vested interests in England. Economists often discuss what are called terms of trade, having to do with the balance between imports and exports. If you import a lot of raw materials that don't cost much money, and then increase their value through manufacturing and other processes, you can turn around and sell the finished goods for more money than the cost of the raw materials. Your country will turn a profit, earning more from exports than you pay for imports. This is one of the oldest trading games in the world, and every country would like to play it as much as possible. England was no exception. In colonial times, when Franklin was writing, it was a crime to smuggle plans for manufacturing machinery out of England in order to build factories somewhere else and compete with the English factories. If you were caught with blueprints for a textile mill in your luggage, they would toss you into a prison hulk out in the harbor, throw away the key, and let you rot in jail. A few clever Yankee traders went to England, worked in the factories there, and memorized all the machinery by sight. Even without blueprints, they were able to return to the stony New England rivers outside Boston and other cities, build water wheels and factories, and recreate the English machinery they had seen. Franklin is trying in this pamphlet to argue that England should actually encourage such industrial growth in the colonies, not try to choke it off. Everything else in the pamphlet is aimed at that objective. After you answer the next questions about the article, we will explore his various arguments for allowing the American colonies to build their own factories, despite or maybe even because of their rapid population growth. Fear of the English factory owners, of course, was that if the American colonists were allowed to build their own factories, they would no longer buy anything from the English factories, throwing factory workers in England out of work and ruining the fortunes of the owners. How does Franklin try to overcome these fears? Having pointed out how fast the population was growing in the colonies, Franklin realized this might just frighten the English even more, so he emphasizes his point about low population density and tells them that it will take ages to fill up the continent to European levels of population density. In this, he was quite correct. Even today, more than two centuries later, the population density of North America is much lower than for Europe. Why should this make the English factory owners rest easier? Franklin's main argument is very simple and has to do with the price of labor, meaning the wages that working men can demand. Quote, labor will never be cheap here, where no man continues long as a laborer for others, but gets a plantation of his own. No man continues long a journeyman to a trade, but goes among these new settlers and sets up for himself, unquote. The alternative of getting your own land and being independent was always available in America, in a way not possible for working people in England, so anybody with a factory would have to pay really high wages just to get workers to stay on the job, instead of taking off for the frontier. This means the English factories would be able to make any kind of product cheaper than the American factories and sell at prices the Americans couldn't match. So don't worry, England, Franklin is saying. We can't compete with you on price. You'll always win because we have to pay our workers too much in comparison. In fact, he goes on to point out that competition with American factories might even keep the British factories on their toes, make them more efficient so that they would be better able to compete with other foreign nations and not lose out in the global competition for markets. There is one glaring exception to the higher cost of labor in the colonies, though, and Franklin knows that he must deal with it head on. Although slavery was already under attack in England, in the American colonies, slavery was alive and well, flourishing throughout the economies of the southern states in particular. In the past, slaves have been employed almost entirely in agriculture, but with the rise of factories, what was to prevent the slave owners from building their own factories 
and working the machinery with slaves who got no wages at all. Surely that would allow them to undercut the British factories? But Franklin says no. Quote, it is an ill-grounded opinion that, by the labor of slaves, America may possibly vie in cheapness of manufactures with Britain. The labor of slaves can never be so cheap here as the labor of working men in Britain. Unquote. This sounds like an outrageous piece of nonsense when you first hear it. People working for no wages be more expensive than wage laborers. But Franklin counts it out for his readers. The English working man goes home from the factory with his pitiful little pay packet, and the factory owner is done with him, no further costs of any kind. The American slave gets no pay packet, but the slave owner must buy the slave, perhaps pay interest on money borrowed for the purchase, take out insurance on his life, pay for clothing and food and shelter since slaves paid nothing for room and board, deal with medical expenses for sickness and injury, and hire overseers to keep the slaves at work. All of these expenses of owning slaves, says Franklin, add up to much more than the wages that English factory owners were paying their workers. If we accept Franklin's calculations, ignoring the idea that slaves can also come from other slaves through natural increase, this obviously raises a very important question. Franklin asks the question himself and answers it. Quote, why then will Americans purchase slaves? Unquote. And again, the answer goes back to his point about low population density and the opportunities of the frontier in a new country. Quote, because slaves may be kept as long as a man pleases, while hired men are continually leaving their masters and setting up for themselves. Unquote. So Franklin feels as though he has covered the major reasons why English factory owners should not fear competition from American factories. First, American factories work by free men have to pay higher wages than in England to keep men on the job. Second, factories worked by slaves, though they pay no wages to the workers, have to pay all the costs of acquiring and maintaining slaves in their daily lives, and Franklin insists that these costs are also higher than English wages. From these two points, he feels secure in arguing that England should go ahead and let the Americans build their own factories. It would only generate more business for England in the long run, he says. With this critical argument about comparative wage levels out of the way, in the rest of his pamphlet, Franklin can relax a little bit and get more philosophical about the population and population growth. After you respond to the next questions about the article, we will see that just like Botero, Benjamin Franklin also clearly identifies himself as a populationist who thinks that such growth is an inherently good thing and a sign of progress and virtue published his reflections in the 1600s on what makes a city great, Franklin in the 1700s also offers some thoughts on what makes countries great. We have moved from city-states to nation-states, but the arguments remain pretty much the same. What does Franklin think diminishes a nation, as he puts it? First, being conquered by foreigners will impose new costs on the natives because the conquerors will exploit them for their own profit and people will have smaller families and population will decline. Similarly, if you lose part of your territory and your people are crowded into a corner of your former lands, they will have less food to live on and eventually this will mean fewer people. Third, if you lose business to other countries, the loss of jobs will mean fewer families able to support themselves, again resulting in population decline. In each of these cases, Franklin clearly views such losses of population as a bad thing a diminishing of the nation. He also suggests, like Botero, that bad government will diminish a population, both because some people will flee to better governed countries and because others who remain behind will be discouraged and less able to support their families. But he saves his heaviest artillery for another barrage against the institution of slavery, which he believes not only causes population decline in a strictly numerical sense, but also in economic and even in moral terms. He points, he points to the example of English sugar plantations like those found on Caribbean islands. Poor white workers are thrown out of work by the import of slaves, so they can't support their families and contribute to the population. On the other side, quote, a few families acquire vast estates which they spend on foreign luxuries 
and educating their children in the habit of these luxuries, for the same income is needed for the support of one that might have maintained 100." Unquote. White slave owners, in short, become proud, lazy parasites. Quote, the white children become proud, disgusted with labor, and being educated in idleness are rendered unfit to give a living by industry. Unquote. The slaves themselves, of course, are worked too hard, poorly fed, and die off faster than they can reproduce, so a constant new supply must be imported to keep this incredibly inefficient system going. There's nothing good to say about slavery in any respect, according to Franklin. With his eye on the goal of population growth, then, a good populationist like Franklin goes after any target he comes across if such a target threatens the goal. This is why he throws in a complaint against luxuries, which really doesn't have anything to do with his basic argument about letting Americans have their own factories. Quote, The greater the common fashionable expense of any rank of people, the more cautious they are of marriage. Therefore, luxury should never be suffered to become too common, unquote. As we will see, this argument about luxuries also caught the attention of Thomas Malthus several decades later. But eventually, he turned it completely upside down and used it as the key to solving what he regarded as a fundamental problem of population growth. Franklin closes with some vivid images about what he calls the prolific nature of of plants and animals, what Botero had already called the virtue generative. His imagery of exponential growth is particularly memorable. Quote, Was the face of the earth empty of other inhabitants, it might in a few ages be replenished from one nation only, as for instance with Englishmen. Unquote. The only thing that constrains this potential for filling up the earth, he says, is, quote, made by their crowding and interfering with each other's means of subsistence." Unquote. This is just what Botero said about the virtue nutritive setting a limit on the progress of the virtue generative. Franklin is faithfully setting out the populationist argument in the mid-1700s, carrying on the ideas advanced by Botero a century before. After you respond to the last questions about this article, we will go on to observe the full flowering of this argument in the writings of Thomas Malthus himself.